what I do in my day-to-day -day work involves uh, OpenStack, Ceph, Swift, uh, a lot of Puppet. It's a love-hate uh, relationship. I, <laughs> I, do, I do some Xen Server too. Uh, before this, I was doing uh, mostly high availability uh, web and database clusters. I love Python. Love Python. So uh, who uses uh, object storage? Anyone in the room? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Very right, interesting. Um, object storage is not reserved for hackers anymore. You know, uh, with the, what they call the consumerization of IT, uh, everything is packaged, made it easy to use, right? So who uses object storage? I know my mom does. Uh, I use it as well, and uh, even my kids now. So you too, uh, right? Probably. Um, object storage is everywhere. Uh, and that's because uh, there's a lot of products that use object storage as a, as a back-end solution, right? So uh, I don't think I need to tell you uh, what these brands are about. They store a lot of data, and uh, they, they, use, uh, they, they mostly use uh, object storage as a back-end solution. So use keys for object storage. Um, you have this uh, triangle, good, cheap, fast, pick any two. Right? So uh, as far as storage is concerned, uh, you have uh, good storage. Let's, uh, let's uh, use this one instead. Um, so you, have, uh, yeah, you can have a whole lot of space. You can have a smaller, a smaller amount of space, very important uh, storage. But there's also price that's involved, right? You can have a very expensive SAN. Uh, it's uh, going to be awesome, very fast, lots of space, if you have the money for it, right? Um, you can have uh, a lot of space for uh, just a little bit of money, right? So that, that's, uh, that's what the object storage is about. Um, as, uh, as price for storage and bandwidth goes down, object storage is now very competitive when you want to store a large amount of space. So use case for object storage. Any storage that isn't latency or performance sensitive. So it's really, really good for archival, backups, static files. Um, object storage is not a, a CDN or content delivery network, right? So uh, you'll have content delivery networks fetching files from an object storage, but you usually don't want to serve your, your static content off directly off of uh, an object storage solution. Um, there's also a distributed computing. Um, the, I, I know for a fact that um, in OpenStack, uh, there's the Sahara, pro Sahara project that works uh, with Hadoop. And uh, so it, it's starting to be a trend uh, with the big data and things like that. So let's talk about backups. And um, this first tool that allows you to manage backups, it's Duplicity. Uh, Duplicity is, is an utility that compresses and backups your files. Uh, it encrypts them locally, allows you to upload them away using as little bandwidth as possible using the rsync algorithm. Um, Duplicity is a generic backup tool. You can backup to files, you can backup by FTP, by uh, SCP, but there's also the Swift backend, and that's what uh, is interesting for us right now. Installing Duplicity, it's packaged upstream uh, by Ubuntu. Uh, we'll talk mostly about Ubuntu uh, with the, our, our current setups. Um, you install Duplicity, it's packaged by Ubuntu. Um, and uh, if you want to have the Swift backend and you're using Ubuntu Precise, uh, it's still maintained by, um, by a Duplicity uh, maintainer team. Um, but uh, you want to have uh, the PPA if you're using uh, Precise. So really easy to install. Um, if, uh, you, if your Swift uh, deployment is backed by Keystone, which is the OpenStack authentication service, um, Duplicity doesn't install Keystone client for you, so you need to install it either through apt or uh, uh, pip, uh, for, uh, directly uh, straight from PyPy. Um, Duplicity and encryption. So I said earlier that um, Duplicity is able to encrypt your files before uploading them to the cloud, and please do, because you don't want the NSA to look at your cat pictures. <laughs> um, generating a, a password-protected uh, secret encryption key, you can do that with uh, GPG, GPG, right? Um, so 
th this, this private secret key is going to be password protected. So that means that duplicity with that key, it will encrypt your files. And even if someone gets a hold of your key, if he doesn't have your password, the key is no use. So it's kind of a two-factor uh, authentication. So uh, only you, hopefully, can read your files. Using duplicity with Swift, it's uh, really, really easy. Uh, you need to find a way to provide duplicity with the credentials uh, to your Swift uh, object storage service. Um, you can do that in line like with parameters, duplicity, uh, uh, minus, minus, uh, Swift username, and things like that. But it can, it can also read um, environmental variables. So uh, I have uh, this uh, script that I use uh, just for exporting uh, credentials. It's really not great to have like uh, username and passwords and env environmental variables uh, until I find a better way. That's how I use it. Uh, and um, when, when Duplicity will do your backups, it will ask you for your GPG passphrase. You can either provide it to an environmental variable or um, it will ask you the password before uh, uh, doing your backups. Um, so how do you do backups with Duplicity? It's really, really simple. Uh, you provide the folder you want to backup and the destination of your backups. So. Um, it's a, it's a bit like a rsync, for instance. You have what you want to copy and where you want to copy it. And th in this case, it's like a new URL format. It's a Swift and then the container you want to send your backups to. Uploading backups, it's sending the entirety of the slash root folder to the Swift container because it's the first time I'm, I'm, I'm uploading it. So it compresses the data, it encrypts it, sends it to Swift, the entirety of it. So we can see um, at, the, at the bottom um, the raw delta size and the total destination, destination size change. So it's about uh, 10 megs. I didn't have a, I wasn't running databases in slash root or anything. So it's just like 10 megs, it uploaded and backupped that to Swift. But now, if I do it right away, after I sent my backup to Swift, um, what we see here is that uh, the raw delta size and the total destination, destination size change is really, really small. So what Duplicity does is it doesn't upload all of your files all the time, right? It only uploads what changed since the last backup. So it's really, really inefficient in that way. So if I look at uh, what it looks like on Swift's hand uh, with the Python Swift clients, what we see here is that there, well, everything is encrypted, right, GPG. Um, you have the, f the initial full backup at the very top here. Here, I have a projector, let's use it. So you have uh, the full backup here, right? And then the incremental backups that are all timestamped. So, um, uh, as you do backups every day, it's, it's just going to back up what changed that day, essentially. So if you do, if you do backups every day, it allows you to uh, restore backups. Oh, that didn't make sense, did it? Um, so if you want to restore backups, uh, it's, it's actually uh, really simple. You call the duplicity command, command line. You tell it you want to restore a file, so I want to restore this uh, very important SQL file that, that I deleted, my database. Um, you tell it where the, um, the file is, so in this case it's in Swift, the root backup container in Swift, and where I want to re restore the file. So uh, in this case I want to restore it back to its original location, which, which would have been uh, slash root slash important file.sql. So that's how I would restore the most recent version of that file. But if I happen to want uh, the one that was uh, there like three days ago, because it changed in the meantime, uh, Duplicity allows you to do that. So what I'll do is really the same command, uh, but uh, it allows you to give uh, a time parameter so that you can restore an, an older version of the file, I'm sorry. Um, Let's talk about other use cases with Swift, right? So you have uh, Duplicity 
And there's a lot of tools out there that have a tight integration with Swift. It works with Swift out of the box. But you have other applications, software, tools that you might want to use with Swift, but they don't know how to talk to it. So you have to find some way to uh, abstract Swift and just uh, try and make it work with it. So that's why there's a project that's called S3QL. So S3QL, what I call it is, uh, I call it the file system over HTTP with OpenStack Swift. But also, um, it, it works, it, OpenStack Swift is just one of the backends for S3QL. So you have Google Storage, you have Amazon S3, it just happens to work with OpenStack Swift as well. Um, it's stable, it's production ready, or so it states, uh, they, they pretend to be. Um, it's, it effectively provides a, a file system of uh, dynamic and infinite capacity because the file system resides in the object storage. So uh, as long as you have the money to pay for a larger object storage, uh, it can just scale to uh, terabytes and terabytes if you wanted to. It's a standard conforming Unix file system. It's really once you've mounted the file system, you could you don't tell someone what file system that is, and you could believe that it's ext4. Um, it's compatible with Linux, FreeBSD, OS X. Sorry, no Windows. <laughs> Windows doesn't have Ceph either. Oh, God. Um, it does compression, disapplication, encryption, and snapshots out of the box, and that's really, really handy. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, ins installing S3QL, it's packaged as well, so no configuring and uh, installing from source. Uh, it's also available from source, but it's, it gets complicated quickly. So uh, it's uh, packaged in the universe Ubuntu repositories or in the PPAs as well. So if you want to install it, you want to uh, enable the universe repositories, and then uh, you want to install uh, S3QL. It's really, uh, as far as installing it, it's really that simple. Uh, sending up a street QL, well, just, I mean, like duplicity, you need to find a way to provide your Swift credentials to S3 QL. So how uh, S3 QL by default expects um, a credentials files to be uh, located at, uh, in, in the home directory of the user, in the Hoth info 2 file. Um, and the format of the credentials, it's the tenant username password. And then in this case, um, in, in this case, Swift is backed by a Keystone authentication service. So it's using the Swift Keystone backend, and then you have the Keystone hostname, the region, and the container you want your file system to be in. Still no questions? No? Uh, so the question was, um, uh, what about uh, the other parameters for key to Keystone, right? So no slash v2 slash tokens uh, or port or things like that. Um, in my experience, uh, we have uh, a Keystone that is on SSL, so HTTPS, um, and I didn't need to specify that it was an SSL uh, Keystone. Uh, I didn't need to specify that it was on port 443. I didn't need to pass the slash v2. Um, just worked magically. I'm not pretending it, it, it's black magic, but it certainly seems to be. Um, um, setting up S3QL, um, you need to create the container the file system will be in, because S3QL doesn't take, doesn't take care of that for you. So you, you can do that in whichever way you want, you, through Cyberdoc or a Swift client. Um, a way of doing it is doing a Swift post on a container, and if the container doesn't exist, a Swift client will create it for you. Um, then what you want to do is to initialize the file system, just like you would do with a block device, for instance. So instead of doing uh, mkfs.ext4, they have this binary that's called mkfs.s3ql. Um, you provide the, the same URL you provided in the authentication file, and it's going to use the username and password that you provided in that file. Um, and uh, uh, before, uh, th th there's, a, there's this little scary disclaimer here, right, that's, uh, that says that before using S3QL, make sure to read the user's guide, especially the important rules to avoid losing data. Um, 
there's documentation around SQL, uh, but these precautions mainly uh, revolves around common sense because for, with some services such as uh, Amazon, they don't uh, guarantee consistency of data. So it, it revolves around knowing the limitations of object storage, what you can do with it and what you can't do with it. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's it. So we see here in the uh, initialization of the file system that it asks for an encryption password. With this password, it will generate a key with which the file system will be encrypted. So if I look at Swift, what's inside Swift, I won't be able to read what it is because it's encrypted. Um, so what we see here is essentially it initializes the file system uh, with all the metadata uh, for, uh, that's necessary for it to work. I'm a bad guy and I run as root often, so I'm not sure if that works uh, as a regular user. I would, I would believe so because this happens in Swift, right? It's not in local file system. Right, right now what we're doing is that we're essentially uploading metadata to the Swift container. Looking at Swift side, this is, this is the kind of uh, files that, that we see. So right now we have an empty, uh, an empty file system that's initialized on, uh, on Swift, essentially. Uh, there's six objects, uh, really, really small. And uh, well, uh, there's not much uh, about it. Uh, there's uh, the encryption, uh, the, the, the necessary encryption files, essentially. Um, so mounting SQL, uh, you create I still don't know if that's root. <laughs> uh, let's, let's check after, okay, I'm, re I'm really curious too. Um, so I create a, a folder uh, in which uh, the, 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 I will mount the file system, right? So, and then you have a, a mount binary to, uh, to, to mount the container locally, essentially. Um, so you provide, uh, again, the URL of the, the keystone that you have, the region and the container you want, and then the, um, the location of your mount point. Um, so what we see here is that it asks you for your password, so you can't mount the file system and read the file system if you don't have the password to unencrypt uh, the, uh, the, to, to the file system. And we also hear, uh, we, we see here that uh, it's setting a cache size. And that's because SQL caches locally data, uh, both for read and write. So essentially it will, um, if you retrieve a file that's backed by Swift uh, over SQL, it needs to download the file, right? So because you're requesting the file, but the file is not locally here, so it's in Swift. It will download the file and keep it locally uh, with uh, this caching uh, mechanism. And it's a bit the same thing for uh, writing data. So you, you write data to the file system locally and then it will eventually, it's like a, an eventually consistent uh, way just like Swift works. So it will upload the file afterwards. So once the file system is mounted, this is what it looks like. You could really mistake it as just any regular file system like ext4. Uh, there's nothing in it, and you have a lost and found folder. And um, something that's really interesting here is that it's showing as one terabyte of, of data uh, of free space available. And the reason SQL does that, uh, straight from the documentation, right? So um, the, 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 the Linux doesn't have um, a concept of infinite space. It needs to know, like, what kind of space is, it, is this thing taking and what kind of space is available. So this file system is showing as uh, one terabyte, but it's never going to be full. It's, uh, um, when you reach a certain amount, it's just going to uh, dynamically uh, ensure that you're using half the space. So for instance, if you have one terabyte of data in that file system, it's going to show one terabyte used and two terabytes uh, total, so you'll have 50% uh, space. So it, it, through Fuse, it makes sure that it, it, it stays compliant with the general rules of you know, Linux and computing and stuff like that. 
Um, so, uh, using the file system, uh, just like a, a little bit, a little test here that's done a lot to show the performance of sequential writes to a file system. Just uh, translate, I'll translate that command to everybody. Uh, writing a lot of zeros into a file, actually a whole lot of zeros because it's one gigabyte, one gigabyte worth of zeros. Um, so writing one gigabyte of zeros, uh, it completed that task in 80 seconds and really was limited by the connection speed that was running on the server. It's around uh, 100 megabits, so 13 meg second. Um, but what's, what's really interesting, oh sorry, was there a question? No? Okay. Um, but w what's really interesting is this. Um, I just uploaded a one gig file. I look at Swift, but I don't see any gig file. So it, I do, uh, I check in the mount point, I see there's a one gig file, but it, uh, on Swift's end, it, it, it was compressed. So really, uh, th th this is, this is this, the next slide. Uh, it provides this compression and duplication out of the box, so it's it, it it's it, it, it gets complex really quickly when you're talking about the duplication, and it's really funny because in the documentation it says, "Don't ask how, how the duplication works; just be thankful that it works." Uh, so I mean, the the guy uh, the the guys that are uh, that are maintaining this uh, are obviously good at what they do, uh, better than me, in fact. But um, the idea that it, it provides compression, that uh, it's really interesting because uh, what, what's, what's costing you money is the amount of space that you're taking in the object storage service, right? So if you have compression and displication on your file system uh, for backups and archivals that are a really good use case for SQL, it's re it gets interesting really, really quickly. Um, Going full circle for fun, right? So you have S3QL, you have uh, this uh, file system, and you could use Duplicity that we used earlier, but with, with the Swift backend. You could ask Duplicity to put your slash root into your S3QL, but then you would get encrypt, encryption twice and compression twice. But it's just saying that once the file system is there, you can do what you want with it. I still want to run MySQL, but I mean, let's do it for the fun of it. Um, so, yeah. Um, and li like I said at the beginning, right? So, uh, disk space, bandwidth, connection speed, prices are going down, uh, capacity is going up, speed is going up. Uh, solutions like Duplicity and SQL are just going to be become more common, uh, and consumer consumerization of IT is a is a real is a real thing. Uh, my mother uses Facebook and she doesn't know what she's using, but I mean, it's simple to use. And back a few, a few years back, object storage was really complex, hard to consume. There weren't a lot of APIs, there weren't a lot of uh, uh, integration. Uh, this is no longer the case with tools like uh, Duplicity and SQL. 